Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the discussion forum on caring for wet collections. I'm just going to introduce the panelists for today and get us going. Oh, before before I start, I need to introduce myself. I'm Furufero Tamani. I'm the Science Communication Officer for the NSCF. Um, I'll be in the background today. And um, and I'm just going to introduce everyone. So in the panel today, we have Michelle Hamer, as always. Um, Michelle is the NSCF lead, followed by Christian Stienkamp. Christian is the NSCF curation technician, and he focuses on hepatology. With him is Adrian Jordan. He is also the NSCF curation technician, also a hepatology. And then we'll have Audrey Ndaba, who is the NSCF collections management coordinator. We all know her. And lastly, we'll be Gosnati Mazungula from SIAB, and he's the collections manager there. We also have dealing with the recordings, the editing of the recordings, and so on. So it's also on the background. We also have Chanel Ribeiro also on the background, helping us with the slides and the technical support. So I hope everyone is okay today. It's cold where I am, and I'm guessing everywhere in the country is cold. So I hope everyone is keeping warm and keeping sane with these load shedding troubles. Um, let's move on to the next slide. I'm also just going to go through some meeting guidelines just so that we know what to do. So for our engagement in this space today, we ask that you keep your contributions helpful and considerate of the hosts as well as other participants. So let's, whatever we type in the chat, whatever we say audibly, let it be kind and not offensive to anyone. Let's use the chat box to say hello. I see we have started this. So everyone has caught up to our tradition, which is very good. So thank you for getting us started. If you haven't greeted, you can go to the chat and say hello or whatever greeting you'd like to say. And just let us know where you are joining us from, so your institution. And then you can also add questions regarding the presentations that will be going on. As you think of a question, please put it down. You can put it in your notebook, but also just put it in the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat and make sure that we get all questions answered. If we don't get to answering all questions, we will try to answer them in the link. So this recording will be uploaded on YouTube and we'll try to get it answered there. We will have um, today, I don't think it's going to be an hour dedicated to discussions. It might be maybe 30 minutes or a bit more, but um, because we have a few uh, presentations today, which I'm hoping you're going to really enjoy. So feel free to have a discussion in the chat if you, if you have something to share and just comments, feel free to do that throughout as we go through the presentations. Thank you very much. We will get started with Michelle and then Michelle will let others present. Michelle? Okay, thanks, Fulu, and good morning to everybody. Fulu might be cold. I'm absolutely freezing. I can't put the heater on because we're having load shedding. And uh, yeah, so I'm freezing. I'm hoping that the load shedding won't affect people too badly. Your participation, being able to link into the discussion forum today. If you do drop out because of load shedding, then you can always catch up by watching the recording that, that Fulu will make available. So what we're going to be covering today 
In the webinar last week, we covered the risks to wet collection. So what were the main risks? And we also looked at the standards for storage and preservatives and for maintaining wet collections. And so today I'm just going to give a very brief summary of the standards for wet collections. And then we'll get into the actual discussion forum. And it's more about the details of how to care for the collection. So rather than looking at what um, storage you should have and um, what kind of bottles, this is about how to look after the collections. And we're focusing on the main risks. So how to look after collections to prevent them from drying out or from having the incorrect ethanol concentration or losing the label information and what to do if you're going to be rebottling, moving from plastic bottles to glass bottles, or splitting specimens to make sure that they're not overcrowded. So how do you do that? What are the key things to think about? And we'll look very briefly at uh, the challenges of buying ethanol, so the reality of uh, customs duty and how to do that SARS registration. So not in too much detail, but just to go over some of those things. And then we'll hear about how do you fix and preserve large specimens? And then also moving specimens from formalin to ethanol, how do you do that? And then just some important points that will come through um, from, from various of the presenters about protecting staff doing this work. So we know that ethanol and formalin, which are fixatives and preservatives, do have health risks for staff working with them. And so what should you do to protect the staff? So it's really about, very much about hands-on doing the work in, in the wet collections. And that's why we're very fortunate to have people who do this every day and who have a lot of experience in this area of work to present and to tell us about what they've learned and how they actually do things. So not from um, people like me who did it a long time ago but don't do it anymore. So I'm very pleased to, to have our presenters today. I think we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so just to, to summarize, and for anybody who missed the webinar, this is the way we need to um, store our, our wet collections. So they must be in a storeroom that has good ventilation, but not windows open. They must have a good fire suppression system because obviously ethanol is highly flammable. There should be a fire door. There must be temperature maintained 18 degrees, so stable. There should be low relative humidity and it must be kept in dark. The, the, space, the specimens must be kept in the dark. Um, for storage, it should be metal shelves and they should be secured with a barrier or you must have metal cabinets. And the containers must be glass bottles with polypropylene screw-on lids or for very big specimens, fiberglass or metal tanks or containers. The preservatives should be ethanol, not propanol, and it should be 70 to 80 percent. And the ratio of specimens to preservatives should be three to seven. So if you think about it, 30 percent of your containers should be filled with specimens and 70% with your preservative. And the container should be filled to one centimeter or 10 millimeters below the thread of the jar. There should be regular documented checks on the ethanol level and concentration, especially concentration if there's been a loss of ethanol, a, a substantial loss. And then your label should be archival quality paper or material, and there should be tested print, printing or handwritten with waterproof or archival quality ink or soft pencil. And there should be regular checks for fading or deterioration of labels. So though that's the basic set of standards. And now we're going to look at processes, so guidelines for how to do 
various activities. Right, and I think at this point I'm going to hand over. Yeah, okay, so over to you. Good morning, uh, everyone. I'll be dealing with the checking and correcting of the ethanol concentrations. And it sort of starts off with the correct jars. If you've got uh, faulty jars or any jars that uh, do not seal properly, um, you're going to have issues with ethanol concentration in your village. Now, there are multiple ways of measuring uh, uh, ethanol within uh, the, uh, the jars or in your collection. Basically, a cheaper option and a more expensive option. So, when we're looking at our cheaper option, we're looking at a uh, hydrometer or alcohol, uh, alcoholometers uh, that um, are quite affordable and measure density uh, of, the, uh, of the fluid preservative. Now, there's a few issues with the hydrometer because it's a more basic approach. And this does not correct for volume or weight percentage at 20 degrees, which is sort of the standard uh, for making ethanol corrections uh, when reading. So it requires some level of calculations later on uh, if you want accurate results from your hydrometer and also if you want to compare uh, uh, densities of the uh, ethanol. Now, one of the big problems with the hydrometer is uh, it works well when you're dealing with tubs or large containers where you can submerge the hydrometer into the uh, fluid preservative. But when you start dealing with smaller jars, smaller containers, you run into a problem where your hydrometer might be too big or too large. Uh, the volume of the ethanol inside of the container uh, might be too little. So in those cases, hydrometer is not the, the right tool for the job. And you would not necessarily be able to accurately measure the, the concentrations of these low volumes. This is where the adult density meter comes in. It's a bit more of an expensive option. You'll see the, uh, the EM835 uh, uh, there in the right hand corner. Some of you might recognize it. It's a bit more expensive, but it's accurate and quick. So you can basically just take your density meter, insert it into the container, uh, take your sample, and what happens then is the uh, device would automatically correct for volume and weight within uh, the, the fluid preservative at a standard of about 20 degrees Celsius. In some cases, or some of the more expensive density meters also take the temperature of the fluid preservative for more accurate reading. Now, what's nice about the handheld density meter is that it uses small quantities. So, uh, like I said, uh, a tiny little vial. Uh, you can uh, you be able to measure the concentration of the ethanol inside of that. We want to the next slide, please. Now, when you're looking at um, you know correcting or uh, monitoring and correcting ethanol concentrations within uh, a collection, apart from uh, the active uh, measures that we have, for example, using hydrometers or the density meters. There's also a more passive sort of uh, laid back approach, which serves as a good overall indicator for the status of your collection, you know, by visually inspecting jars and containers in the collection. And this is the Alcomon indicator system. At some of the institutions, this has already been introduced. And it basically comprises of these two little tablets, one orange and one red. And these interact differently with the fluid preservative inside of the uh, containers. Now, when you add uh, the Alcomon tablets initially to a fresh batch of ethanol that you might have just mixed, you've uh, rebottled or you've replaced all of the preservative in a, a container. It takes some time for these tablets to stabilize. So initially you might see them floating at the top and think that the concentrations are inaccurate, uh, but if you give them some time, uh, the fluid uh, inside will generally start reaching or move more towards the equilibrium state or equilibrium. And um, then if you give the container a gentle swirl, uh, these tablets will start dropping to the bottom. Now, what these tablets basically mean is if both of them are at the bottom of your, uh, of your jar or container, uh, your uh, ethanol concentration is higher than 60%, give or take 3%. If the orange one floats, you are looking at a concentration levels between 50 and 60%. And if both of them float, your concentration is lower than 50%. Now, the 
Tablets are very nice, but there are some cons to it. Uh, so they need to be used with the correct storage as well. So uh, 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 of your specimens in the jar. So very uh, small containers with a lot of specimens in it, or even large containers that are quite densely packed, can inhibit to some extent your ability to see the tablets or for these tablets actually to rise up to the surface when required. So when using these tablets, uh, directly in jars, it's important that the specimen to volume ratio is suitable for that, for, for that method. If you do have large containers with a lot of specimens inside, uh, you can add a small vial with the tablets inside of the vial with a, a permeable uh, stop at the end of the vial to allow the movement of ethanol between the jar or the vial and the larger container. This will then allow you to inspect the small container, uh, in fact, if the tablets do float inside of that. So preventing anything from sticking or getting lodged in between spaces within the specimens. Now, the Alcomon tablet system is uh, quite robust and the tablets uh, do last quite long. Uh, but it's recommended to test these tablets for accuracy every 10 years or so, and if required, to replace them. Move on to the next slide, please. Now, when we check uh, and correct alpha e uh, ethanol concentrations, um, there's an element of protection required. Um, exposure to, to ethanol fumes, if you think about it, um, a prolonged exposure or even acute exposure can have effects on our system, uh, even though that we might enjoy a glass of wine at night. But uh, the main things that we use to protect ourselves, uh, especially our respiratory system, is respirators. And there are various forms of respirators that you see there on the screen here in the middle. Is a 3M half face mask. It allows you to clip off on the bottom and then lowers down the face mask when you are speaking to people or or not actually interacting with any fumes. Now this protects us just from drowsiness and in worst cases, uh, if you have acute exposure, it can lead to uh, vomiting and nausea and even some severe cases, uh, uh, unconsciousness. So even though we have a very relaxed relationship with alcohol in our society, we do need to protect ourselves when we are exposed to fumes for long durations. Now, there are various cartridges that we also use, um, and these are specific to the task. Uh, currently, we are using a ABIC-1 filter, which is a general cartridge, uh, but does uh, protect against a variety of organic gases and, uh, and fumes. Um, you do get more specialized uh, filters for other chemicals, so be aware of that when working with different types of chemicals. Then there's latex or nitrile gloves that we use. Some people are allergic to latex gloves and might need to use nitrile gloves, or vice versa. And these basically just uh, protect us from any contact with the ethanol through the skin. So ethanol can uh, move through the skin and, is, uh, you know, uh, and also sort of affect us through that way. So working just with your hands, uh, your fingers will start drying out and things. So using latex gloves is quite important. Then, when dealing with um, historic collections of, or old jars or opening up old jars uh, that might uh, be, say, compromised structurally, for example, we recommend using a high-risk latex glove. This is, um, if you see there in the top right corner, a brand that we've been using, uh, the Ambulance High-Risk. Uh, and it's very nice because it has happened that we've opened jars or I've opened jars and the neck breaks off. And the ambulance or high risk glove has got a puncture protection built into uh, to it. So it's quite a tough latex and that's prevented cuts from occurring. So uh, protecting your hands is important. And the safety glasses as well. So, you know, when we're working with any liquids, or chemicals, we want to protect our eyes. It has happened to me once. I was placing a specimen into a jar. And I was looking down just to gently place it with my forceps and it slipped out of the for forceps, fell into the jar and had this beautiful little splash come up all the way and hit me in the face. So I then had to rinse, uh, rinse out my eyes. Um, luckily it was only ethanol. It could have been worse, uh, formalin for example. So we used splash protection uh, or protective uh, eyewear as well. Now you get two types, the one that covers your entire face, and then you have one that only goes uh, around the eyes. And that's uh, 
a personal uh, preference or choice. And then obviously lab coats as well, just to protect our clothes from any spillage. Continue. Now, you know, when we think about checking alcohol concentration, we need to think why it's important to do it. And uh, generally speaking, it's something that uh, seems to be neglected in, 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 in collections in general, because the jars are standing there and, you know, they're not shouting and help me or they're not in our way at, at, any, at any stage, but, you know, they sort of like we leave them alone for most of the part. But there's a lot of things that occur or happen with these jars. The most important thing is that they are subject to fluctuations in environmental conditions. And this can be if uh, the room is not adequately closed off or, uh, you know, the jars are not in correct storage rooms, uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, that affects the contents, general light within the collection, the temperature of the collection. I've got 18 to 21 uh, uh, degrees here. Um, that sort of like moves around the point. Um, Lower temperatures are generally more suitable for wet collections. And then relative humidity that if kept at about 50% remains relatively constant. Now, the temperature and relative humidity uh, uh, are the two most important factors um, as fluctuations in these can lead to evaporation and condensation within jars, for example. And um, low humidities uh, within a room can actually create this negative gradient whereby water is pulled out of the jars, again reducing the volume of, 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 the, um, of the preservation fluid in the containers. Now there's a whole host of things. Uh, another thing that's quite interesting is the concentration of vapors and the area. So if you're looking at a jar, the uh, vapor con uh, or pressure of, of, of water uh, and alcohol, there's a relationship there. So the vapor pressure of, uh, of, of the ethanol is higher than water, so that it wants to escape out of the jar. Therefore, you know, if you're looking at the area that that's exposed to, if you've got a, a small or a narrow neck jar, the area that the water pressure and the uh, alcohol pressure is interacting with is actually smaller than just a straight, straight, uh, straight jar. But again, temperature and relative humidity uh, are all playing a factor and creating a uh, environment around the jar uh, that interacts with the environment within the jar based on the seal that you have uh, on your jar, the lid. So, you know, when we're checking for the uh, concentrations of ethanol, uh, we're also basically checking the jars. And what we want to look at uh, is things like evaporation. Now, evaporation uh, uh, will happen in any collection and happens over time. Uh, the rate of evaporation also sort of is determined uh, by uh, various factors, including the seal, the type of jar used. So one of the main reasons for checking for evaporation is basically just to make sure that um, your specimens remain submerged. Um, if a specimen is exposed for a short amount of time, that's not a big issue. But what you will start seeing is salts and things forming on the specimen. Uh, the longer it's exposed. And also, uh, when the environment in the exposed section of your jar uh, becomes uh, or drops the concentration or within the, uh, the, the vapor concentration drops below about 50% or so, you can, can start seeing mold and, and, and things uh, on your specimens. So, checking for evaporation is very important. I can't stress this enough. We've seen this in many of the orphan collections uh, that the specimens have dried out, uh, either completely or semi. Uh, so that's sort of the thing that we need to look at. And then acidification, you know, um, when we're looking at uh, containers and jars, we sometimes see this sort of yellowish orange tinge forming. And this is uh, basically the leaching of lipids uh, and, and the lipids turning into fatty, fatty acids within, within the solution. Now, this is not necessarily an indicator of acidification. So if you see a yellow jar, it's not necessarily a certification. It can be a basic leaching of a large specimen, maybe large bullfrogs, for example, or large snakes like puff adders, would discolor a fresh batch of ethanol in a few days, um, but the concentration is still fine and the pH is still fine. So with the certification, 
uh, there are uh, ways of testing the pH of the ethanol. This is not something I have come across or had to do. Um, it's not in the nature of what we do. But if you uh, are dealing with a collection and you suspect any form of acidification, you would need to follow the procedures for testing the pH of the ethanol and correcting that. If uh, a, a jar does become very acidic or so, I would suggest replacing the fluids within that jar to prevent further degradation. Next slide, please. So uh, just a, a point, uh, so if you look here, um, you know, volume, sometimes we will walk past and say, well, the volume of that jar, uh, there's a lot of evaporation happening and dropping. This is not the best example, but it is an example at least. And so volume is not an indication of the ethanol concentration. You can see here we've got two jars, the one on the left, uh, it's got about 68.3%, uh, but the specimen is just covered. And then we have a more suitable uh, a sort of headroom or space there on the second jar, that's about 71.2%. And that still falls within a 3 or 5%, uh, uh, you know, uh, margin of error, basically, or give or take. So you might think that the concentration will be much lower in the jar on the left than in the right. Uh, but they are, in fact, quite close, and both of them are acceptable. Uh, around the 70% mark. Next slide, please. So when checking and correcting and monitoring and topping up, this is something that should be considered a routine task with collections. Like I said, you can forget about jars and they'll just stay there, but there's a lot happening with them that we're not uh, always aware of. And um, the only way to stay on top of that and to actually manage the collection uh, in a proper way is to work some type of routine into your daily uh, or weekly uh, schedule whereby you can systematically go through uh, your collection and start collecting records and information about these jars. Now, when you are looking at topping up multiple jars when you're setting out a side a week to do this, um, there's some preparation required. You know, um, and I would suggest going through the collection um, or the section that you will be working on to just identify which historic containers uh, you need to replace if you need to replace them. Are there any damaged containers or lids that you uh, might need to replace? So you don't always replace the entire jar, you probably might just fix the lid. Uh, is there any excess fluid loss from containers? So uh, is any container showing rapid uh, uh, decline in, in preservation fluid? Again, the only way of knowing that is to start building a history of your containers as well. And then are there any exposed specimens? And so once you've got all of this information uh, captured, you can then think of a strategy to deal with the topping up. So that might be preparing alcohol or purchasing alcohol, uh, purchasing additional containers, for example. But record keeping is, is, is something that has been severely neglected within the wet collections. Um, and we know little about the history of preservatives with, within many of the jars. Uh, and that's probably something that we can improve going forward. Thank you, next one. So when you are looking at a wet collection, uh, if you are fortunate enough, uh, and this is uh, uh, actual data that we've, we've collected, you, um, you know, it's quite a big task. I'm not gonna lie to you to collect all of this information, but it can be done in about a week or two, uh, going through the collection systematically with a few assistants. And sampling each of your jobs. Uh, now, the idea of this, and you can call this a, a ethanol concentration profile, the idea of this is just to understand what's happening in your concentration. You know, getting to the point where you don't need to mess with the jars too much. So once you've got this established, uh, interacting with the jars on a regular basis becomes, a little, uh, you know, a little bit less. Uh, so when we are looking at jars and we, uh, we know the history of the jar, we know that um, uh, over time, there is equilibrium that forms within the jar, and ideally, we don't want to disturb this by opening up the jar too much, uh, unless we need to. Okay. Then, when we're looking at um, the concentrations of, of ethanol within these jars, 
ethanol between 50 and 80 percent uh, has got antiseptic properties. And once the concentrations drop below 50 or go above 80 percent, we start moving close towards either you with low concentrations, uh, the risk of bacterial growth and mold increasing, distortion of a specimen um, due to increased water absorption, uh, microbial decomposition, and also autolysis, uh, where the cells start disintegrating. When we're looking at stuff above 80%, uh, we're looking at distortion uh, through desiccation and the problem of specimens becoming quite difficult to manipulate if they are requested for measurements, for example. So, you know, with a lot of the uh, morphometric stuff, we don't really want distortion in the specimen. So if you look at the graph here uh, um, of, of this collection here, um, you'll see that the main part or mostly the most of the jars are actually located or has concentration around 70 or so percent, so this is good. But there are a few jars that are below, albeit a small amount, and then a very high jar on the right there, about 88 percent, and that could have been a, a breeding error, or when mixing the, the, the ethanol concentration that was uh, incorrectly mixed and then added to the jar. So everything below 60 uh, and everything above 80 will need correcting. Um, over a period of time uh, when, uh, when suitable. Now, we don't always want to correct when there's a problem. So, you know, there's a uh, almost a reactive approach here. Normally, in, in collections, we walk through and we see, oh, no, the jar is half full, specimen sticking out. That's reactively dealing with this. Uh, and this means then we'll want to top it up with something, which is, uh, as I'll explain in the later, not always the best idea. Uh, but what's more important is if we start getting into the practice of maintaining our ethanol concentrations within 5% or so of our desired level. Now, the reason for maintaining this is we reduce the amount of osmotic stress that the specimens go through during top up. So, if you um, have a, a container that's half full uh, and the concentration is about 40%, and you add an 80% or 85 or 90%, ethanol to increase the concentration back up to 70%, uh, the specimen will experience osmotic stress. Uh, and again, this is also has to do with distortion and things like that. So we don't always want things to drop to levels too low uh, that we have to use too high of concentrations actually to fix that. Next slide, please. So how do we go about correcting uh, uh, the concentration. So the first thing is to make sure that the preservative with, uh, or preservation fluid within the container is actually the correct one that you're trying to pop out. So this has happened before where specimens were housed in formalin uh, and then people are topping up with ethanol, uh, for example. So not knowing what fluid is inside of the jar. So this is also good practice that uh, I think uh, can become quite useful within connections just to understand, uh, you know, with my, different people might be accessing those collections is to label the containers just to indicate what the preservation, uh, preservation fluid uh, is inside or to add information regarding the preservation fluid to your database, so to a field and specify, for example. Now, traditionally, a solution of 80% uh, ethanol was used to top up, so you would mix 80% ethanol and you just walk around topping up everything that was low. Now, this is to some extent a fallacy because the ethanol concentration will gradually decrease over time. And, uh, there have been studies about this. So, if you are only using 80%, which is considered the sort of traditional standard of topping up, you will see concentrations decrease. But unless you're aware of the fallacy, uh, you might think that your concentrations are staying stable. And this again is um, where you do not have precision tools like the uh, density meter to determine these things, or you're dealing with jars that are too small to use other. Now, what is suggested is to use higher concentrations of ethanol uh, to top up, so 87 to 96 percent is much better uh, if you don't uh, uh, have handheld density. So, again, I'm talking about more general topping up, so mixing 87 to 96 and using that to top up. So, if you do have a uh, game a 35 or some type of handheld density meter. Uh, the procedure is quite uh, straightforward and quite fast. 
So first you open the jar, measure the concentration, after which you rinse the uh, handheld density heater with demineralized water or distilled water. And this is just between measurements so we don't have any buildup and, and skew our results. Because there's slight buildup of ethanol sometimes or vapor inside of the machine uh, that does increase the concentration value by about one or two percent uh, if not rinsed properly. So rinsing after measurements is important. Now, tap water can be used, but this increases the risk of lime spells forming in uh, your tubes, etc. So um, if you do use tap water, uh, I would suggest moving over to distilled with mineralized water just to um, prevent that from happening and extend the lifetime of your density meter. Next, please. So after you have measured the concentration, you've rinsed your device, uh, you now know what the existing concentration is of the, uh, of the fluid. And I'm, I'm using a, a quite a big example here with nine liter tubs, but this can, uh, it's more about uh, how to approach this because there's, there are a few indicators or um, there are a few tools to use for estimating how much alcohol is needed to be topped up. Uh, but it's quite easy for you to establish your own system for your collection as you go along if you do keep proper notes. So when we uh, have the concentration of the existing fluid uh, and we have some reference results, like what I will discuss here in the example, we can actually just refer back to that and sort of estimate the amount of uh, um, fluid that we need to remove from our container. And again, this is just with topping up, but topping up <coughs> uh, implies that you allow the volume to reduce. What we are talking about here is maintaining that concentration and, and, and routinely, even, even if jars uh, do not seem to be, uh, have, well, if jars have a, a similar level of volume of what was placed inside it initially, uh, the concentration might still have dropped uh, depending on the environmental variables. So we remove a, a bit of the preservation fluid. Now in my example here, we were using nine liter rinsing tubs and um, these are just the type of notes that we took. So, you know, to move from 18.6% to 25.8%, we, we, were, we, we were required to remove 750 ml uh, of the ethanol uh, mix and add the 750 ml of the pure ethanol. Now, you might say, but why is this number so high? What about osmotic, osmotic stress? Now, this was for rinsing, so we would mix these tubs and they would uh, uh, stabilize and then we would start moving specimens through these tubs. So this is not adding to an existing fluid that has got a specimen in it. For those, you actually have lower numbers, uh, uh, or a, a little bit lower than 99.9%, about up to 96, about the as it should be going. And the same is for the 62% to the 71.9%. So we had to remove 2,000 milliliters there and add 2,000 milliliters to that. Now, over time, uh, when you do this multiple times, you start seeing things. And when you do encounter a jar that has got, or in my case, a tub that's got about 18% of uh, uh, concentration, I know to add or remove more or less 750 mils. If I get to the 62% mark, I know that I need to maybe add or remove about two liters. And these are just the type of notes that can make your life easier going forward. Um, but there are different, uh, and, and if you go onto the internet or uh, uh, if you contact me, I can provide you with some papers there. Uh, some of the uh, uh, people have tried to create these sort of diagrams of scales to estimate um, the amount of ethanol that needs to be added to reach a certain concentration. Traditionally, this was based on just a profile of the ethanol concentrations, but more recently, people have started moving to combination, uh, combining the ethanol concentrations with the actual jar volume. So more or less what the jar volume is and the, uh, the concentrations together uh, to assist with topping up. So taking volume into account, for example, which the method I was using did not take into account. We were working purely on concentrations. So after we've removed the uh, ethanol, uh, we can then add uh, the uh, top-up fluid with the higher concentration. And again, like I said, 80% uh, is the was used, but it's been shown to reduce the concentration at the time. So we want to go a little bit higher than uh, 80%. 
Once we've added the top of fluid, we just want to measure the concentration again. And this is just done by sticking the uh, density meter into the solution again and moving it. And if the concentration is at the desired level, we are done with that jar. But uh, if not, we can take out a little bit more and add some more. And that basically will take us to the desired level. Any of the alcohol that uh, uh, gets removed from the jars uh, can be moved to an alcohol recycler if your institution has this. So you're not losing any of the alcohol that you are taking out. So although you're constantly maintaining that uh, ethanol level at the desired level, uh, if all of the alcohol taken out is recycled and moved back. Otherwise, if not, you can use that as basis for larger bulk rinses uh, that Adrian will go into more detail. Yeah, that's about it. So quite easy, measure, rinse, get the concentration, remove the uh, desired amount, add the top of the fluid, and then you are done. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Adria. Thanks. Um, morning, everyone. I'll just be briefly discussing preservation fluids, more specifically um, ethanol. Um, yeah, preservation fluids forms the backbone which ensures the long-term conservation of specimens housed in any wet collection. Therefore, it's very important to effectively manage wet collections. It's crucial to know how much preservation fluid a collection actually consists of and also the volume it consumes over specific management periods. Apart from this, keeping a detailed record of how much preservation fluid is used and for what it is used help with budgeting and also with reporting losses. And people that's registered with a SARS rebate, they might require a detailed breakdown of how you um, used uh, your ethanol. So in that, in that sense, it's very important. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we determine the volume of preservation fluid a collection consists of? It's kind of simple. You can keep a detailed inventory of both the number and volume of storage containers containing specimens. This will require, if you don't know already what you have, to take a detailed inventory, and this might take some time. However, once you have this, it's quite easy to, to calculate um, what the volume um, of, for example, ethanol uh, your collection um, consists of. This is also where the value of implementing things within your databases, such as storage trees, for example, within Specify, and then linking uh, all the different container numbers with their respective volumes to uh, preparations. And then it's quite easy to keep track of this also because you'll just add sequential numbers as you as you add new containers to the collection and you can build a, a very simple query within, uh, for example, Specify and you can uh, calculate the, the volume uh, of the preservation fluid in your collection. Under normal conditions, stopping up jars with appropriate preservation fluid type will likely uh, be mostly what preservation fluids will be used for, and this is mostly because preservation fluids evaporate and they also get lost when you handle specimens and take them from jars or, or, um, or buckets. Um, and so, so, but also, um, this would also not be the case. You'd probably use more, more ethanol in, in, um, in collections that are very active and that's fast growing. So you'll have to, top up jars, acquire new jars, and this will take up more, more fluid. I think throughout of this, uh, throughout this process, it's very important to document all the preservation fluid use cases, which will enable you to establish a time series of the volume of ethanol a collection requires and consumes over specific management periods. And I think this is very important in terms of procurement. Um, from my, from my side, I know uh, ethanol procurement specifically can be quite a, a headache and it can take a lot of time. So if you are aware of how much and for what you use ethanol over your reporting period, um, this will obviously take um, some time to get kind of the mean value for the different specific use cases, but it will also then enable you to, to plan appropriately. And uh, when you pr procure, you'll procure the correct amount and it will give you sufficient time um, for the procurement process and you won't uh, be left without ethanol in your collection or insufficient uh, volume of ethanol. Next slide. So I'll just briefly touch on this. The uh, most common uh, preservatives, at least from a herpetology perspective that we find within the collections are ethanol, uh, which we usually work with at a 70% concentration. However, not all ethanol 
types are equal. And I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Ethanol also creates shrinkage within specimens, but some, some of the different uh, alcohols create greater, a greater amount of shrinkage within specimens, and one should be aware of that. There was a recent paper that came out about a month ago where they specifically looked at, at annals, a uh, type of, uh, of lizard, where they looked specifically at how the preservation fluid of ethanol and the fixing uh, using formalin actually led to the shrinkage of specimens, so which was quite cool. Then if we look at formalin, formalin is not used that much as a preservative, it's usually used as a fixative. However, there are certain groups or life stages that we rather use formalin for. For example, tadpoles, we preserve within, a, within formalin and also reptile eggs. However, uh, one should be um, aware of the health risks of working with formalin and you should also properly label and indicate uh, any container that's using formalin as a preservative. Then also glycerol. Glycerol is mostly used with stained specimens, uh, silver impregnated uh, specimens. However, there are very few of those uh, cases and they also, glycerol is usually, they contain uh, thymol also to, to reduce uh, the formation of molds and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, not all alcohol are, are equal and some are nicer and better to use in your collection if possible. So it's very, very important to be cognizant when you're procuring ethanol that you are aware of what you are actually procuring. So the first one uh, is this anhydrous ethanol. It's the one on the right, it's 99%. And it's what we within our team refer to as the sweet stuff. <laughs> it kind of smells kind of sweet and it's not, yeah, it's not very, um, bad to work with actually. The downside of, 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 of this is that it's very expensive, um, but where possible one should try and work with anhydrous uh, ethanol. Um, the next one is denatured ethanol. It's basically ethanol cut with some other kind of chemical and I want to draw your attention to the middle one, this 95E5 uh, uh, drum. This is uh, cut with uh, acetate and it's kind of n nasty stuff. It's used in, in, in the textile industry for like clothing and things like that. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, you get a strong smell of acetate when you, when you work with it and it's very toxic. Um, from my personal experience, I believe that the evaporation rate of, of this ethanol is faster uh, than for example, uh, uh, ethanol, denatured ethanol that's cut with, uh, with, with isopropanol. However, this needs uh, further investigation. Um, so yeah, the, the, the pros of working with denatured uh, ethanol is also that um, it's cheaper to acquire. Um, the next one is propanol, or, um, and um, it's also can lead to greater shrinkage of specimens. And usually we are moving away from using propanol, at least uh, I know within herpetology collections. Um, yeah, and it's also used at, usually at a, at a lower concentration, I think about 60%. Um, usually after, uh, uh, you are probably going to rebottle specimens that are in um, propanol, and this leads me to the next slide. So there are various reasons of why one would rebottle. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but um, yeah. So for example, if you have historic preservation fluid, if specimens are in formalin or for example in propanol, you want to get these specimens into new, nice, clean um, um, ethanol, which will prolong uh, the, the, the conservation and the lifetime of these specimens within the collections. Then another reason for, for rebottling is um, containers, containers that are at risk or appropriate containers. If you look to the right, that green drum is one of these household drums uh, used to store containers in, and it's not a long-term solution and you will lose specimens. As you can see, it just became brittle and it, it, it just broke. So when, whenever using drums or buckets and things like that, um, I know f due to financial constraints, it's sometimes difficult, but uh, one should uh, take the needs of the specimens and the collection into consideration. And for that reason, one should uh, opt for high density polyethylene containers to not sit with situations like these. Another reason to rebottle is based on standards is we want to maintain a 70 to, to 30 ratio of specimen to volume ratio. Um, 
especially um, so that's why one would rebottle overcrowded containers because specimens can damage when they fill to the brim when you have to take out uh, specimens in, in very active collections and also when a specimen containers are filled uh, uh, to the brim like that and you remove specimens to look at them uh, you also lose a lot of the preservative within those um, um, uh, containers. Uh, next slide. So whatever the mo motivation is to rebottle, the process, process should always um, be well planned and documented throughout. So before any rebottling process starts, um, there's a couple of considerations you need to 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 make and this is for example the number and size of the containers uh, for specimens to, to rebottle how many uh, containers are there and, and and what are the different sizes of these containers and do you have enough um, within your collection in your inventory to be able to rebottle that um, then also the preservation fluid what are the different preservation fluids within these containers that you are going to or planning on rebottling? And do you have enough, uh, for example, ethanol to rebottle the number of jars uh, or buckets uh, that you want to rebottle? Then furthermore, the storage space. Um, storage is often an issue in, in a lot of collections. So especially when you have to incorporate backlogs or when you have to split containers, it might be that the collection is already so full that you'll have to make alternative plans or alternative storage space um, if you can undertake a rebottling um, um, uh, pr process. Also, what are you going to do with the preservative that you remove from these uh, containers during the rebottling process? Do you have a plan? on how you're going to dispose of it. Do you have a disposal company where you're going to store it or are you going to recycle it? Uh, we've recently uh, got an re alcohol recycler at the Tsong where I'm currently stationed and um, we, we are slowly moving um, uh, old ethanol to this recycler and recycling it, um, which is uh, a good, a very good option. Um, nevertheless, one should have a plan on what you're going to do with the disposal and how you're going to dispose of the, the, the chemicals. Next slide. So I'll just briefly run you through um, how we've rebotted specimens in the past, working with, this, with historic or backlog uh, collections. And we usually take a, a, an approach where you take the specimens through a graded concentration during rebottling. We start off with a, with a, a water phase, then a 25% ethanol, then a 50%, and then a 70%. And this is usually like a, a five-day process. And we never start a rebottling process after Tuesdays. And this is to avoid that any specimens stay in low ethanol concentration over weekends. Then also the rinsing and replacement of old preservation fluid is usually done within the, the original specimen jar. Next slide. So during this, uh, during the process of rebottling, there's uh, uh, some further considerations. And one of the most important considerations is the disassociation of specimen information. And for this, this is one of the big reasons why we rebottle in the same jar. Furthermore, we use a fine mesh when we decant the old preservation fluid in, in, in we usually use 50 liter drums. And this extends the life of the, uh, the fluid we we use to rinse the specimens and also mitigates against this, associ this association of specimen information. It's an absolute nightmare if you decant the, space, uh, decant the jar into, for example, a 50 liter drum and a label or something falls into that drum to kind of match that again if there's already uh, something fallen in there. So using a fine mesh covering the, the, the bucket um, helps a lot, uh, especially not to lose information. Then, furthermore, the storage location of containers. When you rebottle, you should adequately mark the storage location from where the jar was taken. This is very important if, um, if containers and the specimens that's in them have been logged in some asset register or asset verification system. Um, because auditors, if you get audited and that jar or that specimen is not in that jar, there will be uh, repercussions. So it's very important to adequately market and work systematically. For example, 
work shelf by shelf and then um, mark it very clearly from where the jars came from. Then if containers are split due to overcrowding, so you are basically taking a single bottle and splitting the specimens, let's for example say in half in this case, you have to indicate the new storage location and the, uh, the, the container in which the specimens were transferred to from um, and, uh, and uh, send the list uh, to the asset manager to update on the asset verification system as soon as possible so that you cover your basis during auditing. Um, then furthermore, if, you, if rebottling takes place in a different storage location, you will need to probably uh, fill in movement forms um, so one also needs to take that into consideration. Lastly, an important, it's important when rebottling to address any physical curatorial needs of the specimens, for example, fallen off labels. Um, I think th this is very important because we want to handle specimens as few as few times as possible. So when you're working with a container and you are rebottling, it's a good opportunity to, to reattach a label if it's fallen off. Um, uh, etc. Next um, slide, please. Um, yeah, so some further uh, considerations. Uh, you, you, one needs to, to keep track of your rebottling process. And um, one system we, we often use is we place colored stickers on jars that's already been rebottled and, that's, and we place them separately uh, into different organ or and organize them uh, according to some cases, families and things like that. Um, yeah, then documentation of rebottling information. This is very crucial and this should also be done on, on the database. It's the date you've rebottled specimens. It's the concentration of the preserva preservation fluid at the time of rebottling. And also what's the storage location of the specimens um, that's been rebottled. Next slide. Uh, I'll be very brief on this. One thing that you might come across while rebottling or topping up specimens within the collections are, are specimens that are dehydrated and that are uh, high risk of losing them. One way of dealing with them is to rehydrate them, which is often a complicated process and involves various steps. So, there's usually two methods. If there's more methods be, uh, that I'm not mentioning, please. Um, um, you can mention that in the chat, but the two most common methods that I'm aware of is using deionized water. Um, we basically use water, water vapor. Um, we place the specimen on uh, a kind of like inside a bottle with some deionized water and you also thymol crystals in there to um, negate against any mold that might form. Slowly over time, the cells will start rehydrating and then you'll take the specimen through uh, a graded alcohol concentration base, uh, with 20% increments. Um, I know this, uh, one of my colleagues used this method and it's worked well for him. Other method I've also used is uh, ammonia, um, where you use ammonia with, um, with water and then usually place a specimen in there and you switch the ammonia every every second day. Um, and this has also worked well and also negates against forming of mold. You'll, you should, um, because the specimen is dehydrated, you will usually flow to the top. For this reason, I use uh, cotton wool to just push the, the specimen down and then you wash the specimen after, uh, so that all the ammonia gets rinsed off. However, for more details, you can see the Singer paper for the, for the water vapor one, especially. Um, I think it's very important to also document any rehydration treatment a specimen undergoes, because nowadays people are using specimens for, to, to extract ancient DNA and things like that. And um, having a record of specimens that's been um, rehydrated and uh, the chemicals they've been exposed to during the rehydration process might be important for the people trying to sequence uh, museum specimens. Uh, yeah, next slide. So onto printers and labels. Um, so within uh, weight collections, I'm sure many of you are aware of all the different kinds of 
of tags and labels that's within your collections. This is also not an exhaustive list, but for example, there's metal tags. These aren't very, very uh, good to work with because they rust and corrode and they fall off. Um, within the collection I'm currently working, we also have these cloth tags, but they I've seen they tend to tear and the the label inf the, the 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 ink seems to wear off on some of the specimens. So also not a really uh, long-term solution. You also have cotton rag paper, which is probably the most commonly used uh, material for labeling specimens. And then you also have these plastic tags, but they're also not very good to use. One thing with um, with labels is it's often, if somebody writes, it doesn't have a nice handwriting, it's difficult to read handwritten labels, and this can lead to um, incorrect information being transferred to researchers or not being able to to use some of the information. For that reason, we need to move to standardized approaches. Maybe printing is an option, and this is something uh, we are currently looking at. Uh, next slide, please. So moving to kind of standardized, standardized approaches with printers, there's various types of printers and not all of them are, are well suited for, for printing labels. So we have laser jet printers. How these ones basically work is they place the powder on the paper and it melts the, the ink. But um, as far as I know, this, the, the letters on these labels can fall off in the preservation fluid, the ethanol, and it kind of forms this alphabet soup, if you want to call it that. Um, you should generally avoid printing labels with laser jet printers unless you use a special kind of coated paper. And I believe people at the ALC are using laser jets with these special kind of coated paper. So it would be good to get any feedback from if there's anybody from the ALC, uh, um, they could possibly provide us more information uh, about that. Then secondly, we have our inkjet printers. So it's just a carbon-based ink and it absorbs very, very well within, the, uh, within your cotton rag paper. However, it's important to note to avoid specific brands. We've tested Epson and we know it works well, so uh, we'd recommend using an Epson inkjet. Another um, a positive thing about using inkjet printers is the, they're not very expensive and ink usually lasts a long time. Another kind of printer is the thermal printers. Um, uh, they're very expensive um, and but they're also a good option. However, I have, uh, upon discussion with some colleagues uh, they've, that use thermal printers, they've informed me that sometimes uh, because the thermal so, uh, labels printed with thermal printer can kind of have sharp edges. Um, if you have very uh, jars that's overcrowded, it might damage specimens. And if you send out specimens on loan um, with these thermal tags, they they can also cut the specimens in there. However, uh, I think the people at SIAB use thermal printers and they might be able to, to, to share more information and their experiences with the, with the thermal printers. Um, it's just um, uh, normal, the normal ink with the, with the Epson. It's a, carb, a carbon-based ink. Um, anyway, um, next slide. Um, sorry, Tarina. Um, I'll get to the test Teslin paper uh, in a second. So, test, we, so next on, we we did some testing of the different uh, types of labeling paper, and we specifically used uh, our Epson EcoTank um, M1100, which is an uh, inkjet printer, and we used various types of paper during this testing process. We used coat skin parchment. We used Teslin paper. We used an architect's or rice paper, which is very thin. And then we also used the Tsong's paper, which is kind of an enigma, but we suspect it's a type, it's a goatskin parchment and a type of cotton rag. Um, next slide. So throughout the testing process, we had to establish what's the feasibility of using these different uh, kind of uh, uh, papers. So how, what we basically did was we, we printed the labeling test page on each of these different papers. We cut out labels from each of these uh, paper types and indicated uh, using either pencil Indian ink what type of paper it is, 
and then we submerged it into 70% ethanol. We also recorded the date that the, the labels were submerged within the jar. These labels were then sent to individuals at the party institutions to test and report on the durability. And it would also, get, also be great to get some feedback from people who've received these labels and the different types of paper to find out um, how they worked out for you and your, your feeling on using the different kinds of papers. So the preliminary results using uh, of the papers were that the architect or rice paper um, it's not f feasible, it's very thin, and the ink does not absorb, absorb well and the letters bleed into one another. Um, because the paper is also thin, it doesn't feed into the, the printer nicely. The Tsong's paper, which is a type of cotton rag, showed some bleeding of letters. Um, however, it's seemingly more absorbent than other papers. And the bleeding of letters were likely due to the printer settings and a better quality printer that can print at high resolutions likely to solve this. So the Tsong's paper is, is a good option to use. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to goat skin. Goat skin parchment worked wonderfully with using inkjet uh, uh, printer to, to print labels for. Then Teslin paper. The print quality was good, but not, not all the ink is absorbed on the labels and um, smudged with handling. Um, Teslin paper also seemed to dissolve in propanol, so it doesn't seem like it's a good option. However, um, yeah, um, okay, that's good to know. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so it seems like laser jets uh, uh, seem to hold well with Teslin paper. Um, if we draw in conclusions, uh, sprinting of specimen labels with inkjet printers are feasible when printed using high quality cotton rag, for example, goat skin parchment, or when using mid to upper range inkjet printers. And one should be cognizant to use the correct brand of printer. In our case, we recommend using Epson. And these printers should also be um, on the mid to, to a higher range um, so that they can print high resolutions. We have had some experience. We had no fading of labels after two years, and we've also received uh, reports of printed labels showing no signs of fading after 15, more or less 15 years. Um, next slide, please. So basically the takeaway with printing labels using inkjet printers or printers for that matter, is at the end of the day, whether people use thermal inkjet printers, it's a matter of preference, but also affordability. Uh, inkjet printers and the resources are usually uh, cheaper where um, thermal printers are expensive. Um, the most important point is that printed labels should be durable and not fade over time. Lastly, I think it's important that when one prints labels, that no old labels should be discarded and that any label should, that's replaced with a printed version should keep the, the old labels together with the, with the specimen. Yeah. Thanks. I think that that's the last, that was my last slide. Thanks. Okay. So it seems like Audrey is not here, but I'll talk to her slides. So she did some research on procuring ethanol. And just because it seemed like quite a few of the institutions do have problems with, with actually getting hold of, of ethanol and getting hold of the right kind. And so one of the, the key things is that any institution that keeps ethanol, um, you know, that, that has wet collections and has ethanol in reserve, they're supposed to have a flammable substance certificate, which is a fire permit. And this uh, can be applied for from the municipality. So if you have more than 200 liters of ethanol, and if you think about the collections and how much is in there, even if you don't, if it's not your stock, then you should really have this, this fire permit. And in theory, before you can receive delivery of ethanol, they're supposed to ask for this fire permit, the supplier, but I don't know that they always do. So, so that's something to, to think about. And then the other thing is about the cost of ethanol. So ethanol um, is taxed, there's a um, duty on it, but for institutions that use ethanol for, for scientific or research purposes, you can get an exemption, So you, but you've got to register through SARS because the, the 
customs duty is through SARS, and so you have to register the institution to get exempt from that duty. If you don't register, then you will have to pay this duty, and it's about 230 rand a litre. So that's an enormous amount of money. Um, and I don't know that it's payable on the denatured ethanol. Um, we'll have to, to see maybe somebody else knows. But Audrey did also get pricing for the different kinds of ethanol. And so the denatured ethanol that, that Adrian was talking about, that's about a thousand rand for 25 liters. But the pure undenatured, so the proper pure ethanol is about between 9,000 and 11,000 rand for 25 liters. So there's a huge difference in the cost. And I think it just works out a lot cheaper if you, if you are exempt from paying that, that tax. But I believe that it's quite a process to get registered. We do it through SARS. And if you look on the SARS website, you can get the forms there. So you've got to fill in several forms. They listed here. And um, next slide. So you've got to fill in those forms, plus you have to have a registration certificate for your institution. So it says your business, but your institution and or evidence that, that your institution is a, is a parastatal or a state institution. And then you have to say who's your director or your office bearer or your accounting authority. And you have to submit that information. You have to submit a site plan and the intended storage area for your ethanol. And then you need the ID or passport documents of all your directors. So it would, it would probably be the head of your institution. And you submit all of that documentation to SARS. And hopefully that would work. Um, I'm not, I've never done it, so I don't know about the realities. And then once you registered, you're required to keep a register of the use of that ethanol. So you've got to have, keep a record of what came in and then every bit that gets signed out and taken from your storeroom needs to be documented. So you keep like a, a stock inventory. And, um, I think that there's also a requirement that that ethanol is kept uh, under lock. So you can't just have it in a general storage area. It must be kept locked away. And the SARS inspectors can visit, and I believe they do visit, and they check the storage of your ethanol and they check your register. And if it's not all up to date and you can't account for all the ethanol that's used, you can be fined for that. So it is quite a process, but I think that, that everyone will agree that it, it would be worth it financially to get registered and to, to try and get that exemption. So I think that's all we wanted to talk about, just to say that it's, it's quite a big challenge. So Petra is saying denatured alcohol, they paid on average two and a half to 2,800 for 25 liters. Yeah, so to, the pricing is variable. Audrey got quotes from four different suppliers and, and it was quite varied. Um, so the cheapest quote she got for the denatured was 800 and basically 890 rand for 25 liters of denatured. But I think it's also worth checking. So what additives have been put into that denatured ethanol just to make sure that it isn't something that's going to affect your, your specimens. And then, yeah, if you if you buy ninety six percent pure ethanol um, for your for your DNA samples, expect to pay something like ten thousand rand for twenty five liters. All right, thank you. So I think that's all from me. Um, so we're going to pass on to Nkosunati now, and he's going to be talking about quite a lot about formalin. We haven't spoken that much about formalin. Over to you, Gosanati. Uh, <clears throat> okay, good morning. Good afternoon. So the name is Gosanati. So I work for Syab, and I just want to say, so we've been we've been using the thermal printer for 13 years and it's working very well, but we've been having problems with um, getting the print media for it. 
but otherwise it's it's working very well. So I didn't I didn't read any papers. So I've I've seen people are, are, are showing evidence that they that they have read papers on on how these things are done. We this is how I was taught at SIAP and the experience I've had for 13 years working here. Next slide, please. So I, I'd like to start by introducing you guys to showing you the faces um, behind the um, the Cyber fish collection. So we've got Amanda. Amanda is the manages the biobank. Nungkoliso has just found us a found us a very cheap uh, print media for the Datamax printer. We will be sharing that information soon with the network. So Viani Hanisi is managing the chemical store and the and the repair store, the one Michelle was talking about. So the guys from SARS, they really do come and check and they want to see all your records and you have to make sure that everything um, is, 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 is proper. Otherwise they will give you a warning or take away your license. So, and then we have Nungkot, we have um, ZNZ and Nungkoliso. They are working on the Albany Museum fish collection, which is largely, which is largely in propanol, which means it needs to be moved to, moved to ethanol and Zwandile, our safety officer. Of course, Roger Bill's there in the old collection room, now the Margaret Smith um, library. Next slide, please. So the aim, the, the main aim or the, the vision of the of the cyber collections platform. So cyber have got platform, so we are the cyber collection division platform. So our vision is to be the hub of, for systematic research of aquatic taxa in Southern Africa through excellence in collections management. Next slide, please. So the, the, the cyber collection has got two wet, um, wet collection rooms. So, so the majority of the collect, of our wet collection is in 70% is in ethanol. Uh, and we have about 20 to 30% um, that is still in 60% propanol. So tadpoles, we keep tadpoles in 10% formalin. Um, I think they are still debating as to, I think they lose teeth if you move them to, to, ethanol, to ethanol, but there's, there's still some debate. So we'll hear from the experts. And we, we, and we have a small collection of clear and stain, which is in glycerol. Next slide, please. So, so preparing large specimens for preservation. So most of these specimens, especially specimens that are coming from, from guys who work uh, from, from marine guys, they, they don't like putting things in formalin in the field. They like to freeze, freeze and keep them frozen. I remember I, in 2009, I was part of a, I was in the French of Nansen vessel, surveying seamounts all from Reunion Island all the way to PE. So all the guys that were here, so they, they didn't want to put things in football and they preferred to, um, to freeze. Um, and because I was not Dr. Nkosnat Mazungul, I was missed, they did not listen to me. <clears throat> so we got to PE and we found out that the, 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 the freezers malfunctioned and almost of all those samples were, were, um, were damaged, rotten. <clears throat> so it's, it's very important to keep in formalin. And most of these frozen samples, they don't make very good museum specimens because you'll find out when you defrost them and you find out all the, all the fins are closed, their mouths are open. It's just, it's just a mess. It's, it's, I think it's best to keep things in formalin. All right. So, so what we do when it's when it's when we have, so we defrost. Obviously, we need to defrost if it's frozen, and then after defrosting, you photograph it, and then you take a sample of a, a tissue sample, and you we preserve them with 99.9 percent .9 ethanol, and they are put in vials, the tissues, and we use a label. We use a, resist, a resistal paper, which we print on a normal printer office printer and but you need to bake the you need to bake the the paper after in an oven otherwise if you don't bake it then it's going to fade over time so and then all all and then after taking a tissue you 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 inject the the specimen to inject the specimen with um formalin uh, to make sure that formalin really gets in because this big specimen if you if you just put a a big specimen in formalin 
you know it 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 will fix outside but you it will begin ro rotting rotting from the inside so you really need to inject and injecting is a is a is a skill that you that you get over time because when you are injecting you need to make sure especially injecting specimens with scales you need to make sure that you are injecting between scales and and not damage the specimen so so and then you keep the specimen in 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 formalin in 10% formalin for some time you can it, it can be 2 weeks or 3 weeks depending on how big uh, your specimens are and after some time after that i know that there were there were some um, presenters who were talking about this so we keep our specimens in 10 when we are transferring them from formalin now to ethanol we keep them in 10% uh, i mean we keep them in water for a day or until it stops floating if they still float, then you don't remove them from water. After a day or two, after after a day or after they they've stopped floating, you put them in ten percent ethanol for a day and on the for a day again, and then um, a day or two in fifty percent ethanol, and then they are transferred permanently in seventy percent ethanol. And and this has and this has worked very well for us. When I look at the quality of our specimen, especially now when we the the NSCF has allowed us to to go and visit other museums, I think we have the, some of the best uh, preserved specimens. And this is how we are doing it. Um, and then that the, the risk control measures that we are taking. Of course, you you need to we use a a powered air respirator. Um, and we got funding. We had one. We had one respirator before for the before the NSCF um, uh, subsidized us to buy two more. So I think we've got two or four of these respirators. So so we use them, and they are very, they are very comfortable. You 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 forget. You even forget that you are wearing a you are wearing a a, a mask, and they are very comfortable. You even though that that thing at the back is is heavy a little bit. But 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 they are very comfortable to work in, um, and of course even though we, we we need to put other other measures in place. Yes yes you can yes you can wear your mask. Yes you can wear your gloves. You can wear um, um, I, you can you, you can you can wear all these PPEs. But you need to make sure that your engineering controls are working. Um, like like it, at SIAB, formalin is only used in one room and that one room has a formalin sensor if it reaches the uh, if it if, if it if it reaches two parts per million then the alarm will kick in because it's not safe to be there and also the fume hood the fume hood cupboards that we used to extract that we used for, for extract like extraction fans so all those engineering controls they need to be there and also emergency emergency showers all those things they need to be there even administrative controls like your standard operating procedures, your MSDS forms, you, like, like like I was saying, the the, the formalin room is a, is demarcated as a respiratory zone. Everyone who goes there, who works there, needs to be wearing a respirator. It's very important. And also, people who work with formalin need to need to undergo medical surveillance program. Next slide, please. All right, so all the waste that we generate, I, I've already apprised you um, talking about the Albany Museum Fish Collection, which came here at SIAB, I think more than, uh, I think more than 10 years ago. So it's in 60% ethanol, it's in 60% propanol, and that propanol, and we need to move it now to 70% to, to ethanol, and we are generating a lot of waste um, and all the tanks, all our tanks that were in propanol, we've moved them to 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 seventy percent ethanol, which means we have lots of waste. But thanks to the NSF again, who gave us money to buy these recyclers to recycle the waste that we have. So the, the so we've got three recyclers now that are here, but only two are working. Um, so so 25 liter of waste of, of propanol like as i'm saying there so if you when you recycle it you get about 15 percent of 80 to 85 to 85 percent of ethanol and this has helped us so much we don't even have a contract now for we've had a contract for us with a supplier that has been supplying us with ethanol um, for years but because of this we are able to 
were able to have lots of recycled ethanol. Now we have got about 5,000 concentrated ethanol and, and a few drums that are 80 to 85% ethanol. If, even though I'm excited about this, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm still yet to, to, to determine how, how much they contribute to our electricity bill here, because um, we're paying about 30 to 40,000 electricity bill per month. So, so even for formalin, so formalin, I think we did an initial, we did, we did a preliminary test. We are not doing proper, proper, I mean, formalin that much because as you can see, we are only getting about nine to 13% formalin. And many people who go, who many researchers who go to the field, they don't want to take 10%. They don't want to take 10% from, they'd rather take concentrated formalin and then they can mix it for themselves when they get to the field. And one of the things that um, I, I was talking about engineering controls here. So we have a contract with SafeTech. SafeTech, they do air monitoring surveys for our, for, for the collections. And they also do extraction efficacy surveys for the, for our extraction system. So one thing that they have identified for us, if you, if you look there, so the, the occupational health and safety of the hazardous chemical substances act has been repealed. Um, you see the, the expose, the ex, what do they call this? Um, it, I think it's an expose, it's an occupational exposure limit. So it was two parts per million. And now it has been repealed. It's zero, I think it's 0 0.2 now. So as from September, the new regulation, it's saying it's 0 0.2 which means in those two rooms in our collection, we are, we are not gonna be compliant. It's gonna be very unsafe working, in, working there as from, and, we, and from, I mean, re, the regulation says that, but it's not even safe now, but thanks, but because we have the, we have the, um, uh, the, the, the respirator, so it helps, but because of these surveys, and we are able now, what we are working on now is, is putting sash doors on the, on the fume hoods so that we can, so that the extraction, we can, we can increase the extraction and also to help people not to get exposed to the, the chemicals. So, yeah, so it's very important. It's very important to have these air monitoring surveys and extractions efficacy surveys because you would think your engineering controls are working and they are not working. Um, next slide, please. I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank oh. you, very much. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks very much for your contribution and to yeah. Christian. Adrian as well. Yeah. So I think, can we go on to the next slide? Okay. So I think that what we've learned today, probably just more than, than in the webinar, just hearing from people who are actually working with wet collections is um, just how specialized and technical this work is. It kind of had to move away from just putting specimens into ethanol and labeling them and putting them on a shelf and topping them up just you know sort of every now and again we have to become very scientific about the way we look after these collections and so for the the next assignment which is assignment 10 now and not only for the assignment but for anybody who's looking to implement the NSCF curation and collection management manual I think an important thing is to, to, first of all, you start off with an assessment of your wet collection and look at it in terms of what is its current status, curation status, and what do you need to do to meet the standards. <clears throat> Before you can start actually doing things, you first need to know what is the current state of, of our wet collection. It may be, you know, 90% to what, what it should be. It may be 10%, but unless you have that sense of the scale of what you need to do and the details of it, you're not going to be able to make good progress. So I have drawn up a template and I need to add a few things. I think 
coming out of um, the presentations this morning, it becomes very evident that you need SOPs for topping up. You need SOPs for correcting ethanol concentration. You need SOPs for rebottling. You need SOPs for monitoring of ethanol levels and recording. And then also SOPs for disposal of your waste preservative or fixative. So I think those are things I just need to add to that template. But I think the other thing to do is to look at the storage environment and check according to the standards, what have you got? What do you still need? If you've got something that it doesn't work properly, what needs to be done? And then your storage infrastructure. So looking at your shelves and your cabinets, are they metal? Do they have that barrier? Um, looking at the containers, are they glass bottles? Do they have the proper lid? Or do you still um, have lots of plastic? If you have bigger specimens, are they in ordinary plastic buckets or tubs? How many <clears throat> of each? So you might have some in bot glass bottles, some in plastic. What what sort of proportion? What size? All of that you need you need for your own planning and budgeting. Um, need to understand that, and then also the preservative type. So what kind of preservative do you use? And to do a quick assessment, you know, are are the levels okay in general, or are, is there a big problem with the level of how full they are? Do you have any idea what the concentration is in your containers? And I think it was Adrian had a um, maybe it was Christian had a very nice kind of form that can be used. So do you have any idea? And then also the labels, when last did you do a check of your labels? What do you use? Do you need to change it? Do you need to reprint labels? Are they fading? And then also to look at whether you have records and plans for topping up, rebottling and relabeling. And I need to add that um, also your SOPs. Because you can see that if you if you don't do things properly, you're going to cause more damage than, or as much damage as doing nothing. So I think the SOPs are really important. Next slide. So just some guidelines. So, you know, um, I know that curators often have a good sense in their mind of, of what the status is. But it really needs to be documented. It needs to be gone. You need to go through a systematic process of checking and writing down and documenting what needs to be done. And from that, you can then develop a plan, you know, and include how many staff are needed, how much budget is needed. And then you can um, schedule depending on how much money you've got available and how much staff time you've got available. You can't, if, you, if you've got a big wet collection and there's a lot that needs to be done, you won't be able to do it all within a month or six months or maybe not even a year. It might take you three years, but it needs to be, it needs to be planned. And then, um, you know, so it's just, if you have a very big collection and you want to do this assessment, it might not be feasible to count every single bottle um, and to look at the level on every single bottle um, and to measure the ethanol concentration in every single bottle. But you could just estimate how many, what proportion of your collection is still in plastic bottles and document that and, and do an estimation of how many would need to be transferred to glass. So you can estimate a percentage and convert it to an approximate number. Obviously, it's much better if you can do an actual count. So in the in the template that I will provide, and it's it'll be for anybody whether you're doing the course or not. You know, you can add notes because sometimes you can't just clearly write something in a in a very short space. You need to add some. You know, it's this, but it could be that, or we're unsure of that because of this. And then there's also a place for descriptions and explanations. So the more relevant information you include in that template, the better it's going to be for your planning going forward and, and to get a good sense of what's, what's happening. And if you're doing the post, your marks will be better, more information you include.
Okay, so we'll we'll make that template. It's a spreadsheet format. We'll make that available within the next day or two. And yeah, you're welcome to send any questions. And I think from me, that's all. I think I'll hand over to Fulu to run the question and answer session. Over to you, Fulu. Thank you, Michelle. Um, most of the questions that were coming up are already answered, I believe. But if you feel your question wasn't answered, please raise your hand so you can ask your question. If there's anything new, any new question, please also just raise your hand and we'll let you ask your question. Um, there's also one from Petro. I'm not sure if she was answered about the milky substance in the Teslin paper that comes out of the Teslin paper. Petro, would you like to ask that question or you were sorted? Okay, I see she's not in the house. There's a question from Hotso. It says, how often should one or a curator check for pH value after ethanol discoloration? At, uh, this is for Christian. Hi Hotso, yeah. Um, so um, I don't think it's too regular. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I'm not so sure about the particular of, of, of whether or not anybody has studied this or looked into that, it's uh, it should just put, form part of, of, of your routine. So when you are working through your collection, um, if you do suspect something, uh, depending on the age that it's been in the jar and things like that, if it's been in there for quite a long time and you see some degradation of the specimen already, um, you even see fatty buildups on the side of the jar and things like that, I guess that could be a good time to test it. Um, I don't think dealing with the pH and acidification once tested initially uh, will require uh, uh, too much testing in the, in, in the, in the following months. Uh, so I do think that that period is, 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 is it's not too regular, uh, but it's something that if you have the capacity to do it, um, you know, you get targeting specific jars where you suspect acidification. Once a year would, would probably suffice. But um, that depends on the amount of jars that you, 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 yeah, that you suspect of, you know, uh, going through the certification process. But there's no way of telling it from the outside. So it's a matter of just testing. Um, the pH generally, I think, once stable, does remain quite stable. Um, it's, but it's from the more historic specimens, I believe. Okay, thanks, Christian. Um, so there's, um, there's Tarina. I'm just, I'm thinking that Tarina is answering Petro's question. I'm not sure. Tarina, would you like to come in? Um, I just wanted to say that um, I've never seen the milky substance, but it could be something in the ethanol that that um, created that milkiness. Um, but the, the first time I started to use this was in about 2004, I think. And and it really, it's, it doesn't do well out in the air, but in ethanol, it does perfect well. If you leave it in the sun, it becomes brittle and really terrible but in ethanol it's it's really absolutely i find it very very nice and workable paper very clear um, labels created thank you tarina i see there's a comment from beth saying um use undenatured ethanol it's more expensive but the way to go um there's a comment by Michelle saying a long time ago at KZN Museum, they used to bake the goat skin parchment or iron or iron it after printing with laser printing for labels. Does anyone know about 
whether this works. Has anyone ever done this and does it work? That's um, baking the goat skin parchment or ironing it after printing with a laser printer. Anyone has experience with it? You can just raise your hand. So Adrian says he believes they are still doing this at KZN Museum. Anyone from KZN Museum who can um, give us more information about this or confirm? No one? Sorry, okay. uh, 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 sorry, Pulu. Um, Michelle, when uh, Christian and I was doing work at, at Kaizen Museum, uh, we remember Matabaru used to, he had a small little oven in the one office and uh, uh, all the labels, uh, they were printing, they baked uh, in there. I was, I'm unsure what printer they used at that stage um, to print their labels. I don't think it was our Epson. Um, so yeah, but I mean, uh, the logic that if they are still doing it must works work so yeah i'm just unsure what printer they're using but um, i'll find out right thanks adrian um i don't think there's any more question if you have a last minute question please raise your hand so we can get it answered Um, there's a further answer from Christian to Hotzel. Okay. I guess we are happy and can close. Um, thank you very much to all of you who made time to join us for this discussion forum. Um, and thank you for everything that you shared. Special thanks to all our panelists for giving us some comprehensive um, information. I'm sure that was really helpful. It uh, it really helps to get information from people that are doing the job every day, like Michelle said. So thank you, um, Christian, Adrian, um, Gosinati, and Audrey, though she couldn't present her, her work today. Michelle, do you want to just um, close? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. As Willu said, thanks to the presenters. We learn a lot from each other in this process. I learned a lot today from, from all, all the presenters and um, also from, from, the, from you who um, also give your input. So thanks to you. Thanks to Fulu and Chanel and Nick for setting it up and for doing the recording. And yeah, we'll see you again next month in July, where we'll be moving on to dry collections and looking at caring for herbarium specimens and pinned insects and skins and bones. So we'll see you next next month. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.